But before we start, please give the video a like and make sure to subscribe to Wonderbot and hit the bell so you'll never miss any uploads from us. On exhibit in the British Museum in London lies a very special ancient clay tablet. The 3,766-year-old artifact dates back to Mesopotamia, specifically to a city-state known as Ur. And etched into its face, the tablet has a message, one that fascinatingly expresses its inscriber's profound displeasure. It was a British man named Sir Leonard Woolley who at the start of the 1900s most famously investigated the site of Ur and as a result of his meticulous means of research, Woolley is thought of as a pivotal figure within contemporary archaeology. The archaeologist made multiple discoveries at Ur and helped construct a clearer image of what the city-state was once like. Ur was a special place within the Sumer civilization, which itself stands as among the first ever mass societies in history. Sumer itself lay in the south of Mesopotamia, in the southern part of what we today know as Iraq. And experts believe permanent settlements first sprung up in Sumer between 5,500 BC and 4,000 BC. It's thought that Sumerian society really started to take shape though between 4,000 BC and 3,100 BC. This time is known as the Uruk period, and it saw the land becoming more urbanized. Indeed, towards the end of this era, Sumer had split into multiple city-states. Canals were constructed and boundaries were raised to distinguish between these city-states. Furthermore, each of these places had a patron deity whom the population would worship in a particular temple built in their honor. And at the same time, kings and governors, known respectively as Lugals and Ensis, ran the city. Now, although some believe the earliest cities emerged in India or China, it's actually widely held that the Sumerian cities were the first. Eridu is reckoned to be the oldest of these, and it can still be seen today as ruins. Meanwhile, about seven and a half miles away from Eridu lies the evidence of the city of Ur. Ur flourished in this area, now defined as modern Iraq's Dikar province. At one time, too, Ur stood by the waters of the Persian Gulf, although the coastline has since altered. Nowadays, therefore, you can find the remains of the city quite a distance away from the coast. Back then, Ur was also divided into different districts, with people of specific professions living in the same areas as one another. Streets ran through the city, too, with clearings to allow for public assemblies. There's even evidence that Ur contained designs to aid in flood management. Residents built homes in Ur with plaster and bricks made from mud. Larger structures, meanwhile, were shored up with asphalt. And it seems that the dead found their final resting places underneath houses, buried with objects such as weapons and cooking utensils. When it came to military matters, a series of fortifications standing some 26 feet in height defended Ur. These ramparts lay at a slant, and some of the city's buildings adjoined them. And in addition to these man-made defenses, the Euphrates River to the west added further security. Fascinatingly for us in the present day, evidence of the city has survived through the millennia. And the ziggurat of Ur is among the more impressive ruins of Ur that can be seen to this day. Ziggurats, for the record, were large structures constructed throughout Mesopotamia for religious purposes. Construction of the ziggurat of Ur was started by King Ur-Namu for the sake of honoring Nana, the moon deity. Also known as Sine, Nana was the patron god of Ur and he was believed specifically to look after shepherds. By the time the ziggurat had been completed, King Ur-Namu's son, Shulgi, ruled Ur. What's more, King Shulgi designated himself as a god, and under his tenure, Ur grew significantly more powerful. So it was that by the end of Shulgi's 48 years in control, Ur oversaw a large proportion of Mesopotamia. A number of archaeological discoveries had suggested that the prosperity enjoyed by the city of Ur. Vast quantities of relics made from precious metals have been uncovered there, for instance, and these could only have made it to the city through trade networks. In fact, trade in general was one of the major factors contributing to Ur's affluence. Being a port on the Persian Gulf certainly helped ensure that Ur was a significant place of trade. The city, in fact, received goods from numerous locations around the world. And indeed, a large part of the trade in the whole of Mesopotamia flowed through the port at Ur. Interestingly, too, it's been suggested that Ur had a hierarchical society. 
At the bottom of the social hierarchy were people from other parts of the world who had been seized and put into slavery. Towards the top, meanwhile, figures such as priests enjoyed lives of considerable opulence. There's even evidence of intricate legal and economic organization having existed in Ur. And the discovery of myriad artifacts bearing text supports this notion for one. The Sumerians inscribed such texts in cuneiform, which is one of the oldest writing schemes. The word cuneiform derives from the Latin cuneiformis, which roughly translates as wedge-shaped. What's the connection here? Well, it relates to the wedge-shaped etchings that scribes long ago stamped into the clay slabs, and some of which still bear cuneiform. Anywhere from 500,000 to 2 million cuneiform tablets have been discovered over the centuries. Of these, however, only between 30,000 and 100,000 have been publicly released. Where can they be seen? Well, a great many museums contain extensive collections of such tablets, with the British Museum holding the most. Which brings us back to the central part of our story. It's the British Museum, after all, that houses the previously mentioned special tablet, a relic expressing the annoyance of one particular ancient person named Nani. Nani, you see, carved out his disapproval to a merchant called E. Nasir, who it seems had provided him with the incorrect sort of copper. And the resulting tablet is now recognized as one of the first known recorded customer complaints. Adolf Leo Oppenheim is the man responsible for having translated the text that's etched into this distinctive tablet. Oppenheim was, you see, a celebrated Assyriologist who was born and later studied in the Australian capital, Vienna. It's in fact been claimed that this eminent scholar studied cuneiform more than any other modern-day individual has done so. Oppenheim's expertise is also largely credited with having provided the basis for much of our present understanding of what life was like in Mesopotamia. For one thing, he served as the leading editor of the Chicago Assyrian Dictionary, which sought to take full stock of the Akkadian language, and he remained in this role until his death in 1974. But let's get back to the tablet, whose special message we can be thankful to Oppenheim for translating. What do you take me for that you treat somebody like me with such contempt?" A disgruntled Nani wrote to E. Nasir. I have sent messengers to collect the bag with my money, deposited with you, but you have treated me with contempt by sending them back to me empty-handed several times. Nani's complaint has been inscribed in Akkadian, a long-lost language articulated in Mesopotamia between roughly 2800 BC and 500 AD in cuneiform. Akkadian was made up of about 600 words and syllable symbols, and it's thought that a lot of those symbols were pronounced in various different ways. Not that this probably mattered much to our irate ancient complainant. How have you treated me for that copper? Nani continued. You have withheld my money bag from me in enemy territory. And on top of that, Nani provided a potential solution, one that worked for him at least. It is now up to you to restore my money to me in full he proclaimed. Concluding, Nani wrote, Take cognizance that from now on I will not accept any copper from you that is not of fine quality. I shall, from here on, select and take the ingots individually in my own yard. And I shall exercise against you my right of rejection because you have treated me with contempt. However, it was later posted to Reddit and has since gone viral. Indeed, more than 1,000 comments have been written in response to the post which has also received over 64,000 upvotes. Nani's message is, however, far from the only known complaint that was named at Ian Asir back in the day. It is, in fact, merely the longest and most detailed of a number of them. Yes, at least 12 other cuneiform complaints intended for the merchant's eyes have also been discovered. The tablets were uncovered in what is thought to have once been Ian Asir's home. Each one was aimed at Ian Asir himself and they were all written in particularly bitter tones. That's right, the tablets are linked to one another by the specific irritation that they express. Taken together, furthermore, the complaints paint a picture of who exactly E. Nasir was as a person. It seems that he was a prominent merchant within Ur who specialized in large-scale trade of metal blocks. He also, evidence suggests, worked in the business of formed metal commodities such as food and fabrics. Enesir was, in addition, apparently part of an association of traders known as Alik Tilmun. This group centered in Dilmun, 
an area that stood at what is now Bahrain and Dilmun was well located for business at the time meaning many traders would have flocked there the picture that forms of the traders is fascinating when starting out as a merchant Enesir was evidently involved in trading practices on behalf of Ur's royal residence but while it seems that he was initially thought to be reliable after some time he apparently started to spend more time in Dilmun and some of his clients began to get annoyed as well as Nani's complaint a cuneiform missive from a person called Arbitram has been found that it's also intended for Enesir and much as with Nani it seems that Arbitram had been swindled out of his rightful copper by the merchant Arbitram wrote why have you not given me the copper if you do not give it I will recall your pledges after apparently then not having received a reply Arbitram was naturally upset and compelled to follow up with Enesir why have you not given the copper to my colleague he carved into a tablet be kind enough to give the copper and yet another person Imjir Sin had evidently reached exhaustion because of Enesir's seemingly shoddy business practices in order that your heart shall not be troubled give good copper to my colleague Imjir Sin wrote do you not know how tired I am of this a man by the name of Ilsu Alatsu, meanwhile, is believed to have been one of Enesir's professional associates. And it seems that he, too, had grown weary of Enesir's poor conduct. Certainly one tablet that appears to have been inscribed by Ilsu Alatsu warns Enesir to behave. Act in such a way that the customer will not become angry, he wrote. It's not known whether or not Enesir sent a response to any of these grievances. Based on the evidence of his bad business sense, though, it would come as no surprise to learn that he had not. But that said, experts believe Enesir's manner of working eventually got the better of him. There are signs, you see, that Enesir's prosperity eventually began to deteriorate. For example, his home where the tablets had been discovered was connected to the neighboring residence, and this fact would have considerably lessened the available space of his house. Furthermore, it appears that Enesir was compelled to change the nature of his business dealings. He moved, in fact, into areas such as real estate and clothing, and these markets would have been notably less fruitful than copper trading. So Enesir, it would appear, treated his clients with contempt and ultimately paid the price for it. It seems that he may have been forced out of the well-paying copper market because of his poor entrepreneurship, and he's even remembered for it almost four millennia later.